All right, on. Good evening, everybody. How's everybody today? Good? Wonderful? This is what I would call our good life. Beautiful sunny day. We are able to gather again. That part for me is something that's so beautiful. My name is Elizabeth. I am your MC this evening. My Ojibwe Anishinaabe name is Nanoshkans, which translates to hummingbird in English. And I'm Ojibwe, Odawa, and Potawatomi, originally from Wakumakong on Manitoulin Island, but live here in Sault Ste. Marie, known as Bawak Ting, and have lived here for the last 26 years. Amazing to me how fast time has flown by. Uh, my 27-year-old daughter was a year old when I moved here, and now she's a grown woman, one of my best friends. And uh, very honored to be your MC this evening. This is actually my second show emceeing and uh, really thankful to the people who reached out uh, to me to help move the evening along. I wish to acknowledge the traditional territory that we are a part of this evening here known as Bawating, uh, the heart of the Great Lakes, the heart of Turtle Island, as we call it, the land of the Ojibwe. And I also wish to acknowledge all of our viewers who are watching us uh, online. Beautiful thing, technology, and we got it working, so we're happy. And wish to acknowledge the traditional territory that you are watching us from. Miigwech for this good life, and in my language, we call that Mino Bamadzuan. So I'm really thankful to have you here this evening, and uh, want to introduce to you what you are going to be entertained with. Absolutely wonderful. I got to watch it for the first time last evening. And uh, for me, definitely, uh, the Stories Steeped in Stone series is something that has been brought to life as a result of a number of different people who um, storytell, who use art, who use song, dance, uh, words, and so on to relay messages, to share messages. And I'm really thankful that I've been able to watch a couple of these performances. Each one showcasing a diverse lineup of talent, featuring artists and creatives from the Algoma region who find their inspiration in the stories and culture and landscape of this beautiful region. While the theme may be steeped in stone, no two shows are alike. Audiences have been treated and are treated to music, theater, storytelling, poetry and dance, uh, performance art and heritage demonstrations. 
There's so many different stories and experiences. You will want to catch them all. And one of the good uh, pieces of news I get to share here is that we will be looking to have, it's in the works still, but looking to have each story that has been done up to this point and finishing out the series released again through YouTube. So stay tuned for that. If you haven't had the chance to watch, you will be presented with that opportunity. So this evening, you may be looking up here and feeling excitement as I was. I was really curious when I got here last night for our rehearsal and thought, I wonder what kinds of stories are going to happen this evening. Well, tonight, our presentation is called Traces. And it's brought to life by Annie King and Michael Birch. Uh, I had the opportunity to work with Michael uh, quite a few uh, months ago in some presentation and storytelling that happened, of course, pre-COVID. And what a character. Uh, so I'm thankful to have gotten to know him and reconnect here. Annie, I just met uh, for the first time yesterday. And how amazing it is to me that uh, when something speaks to someone and how connected they are, the way that they showcase it to the world so that we can be connected to them. Uh, so I look forward to watching and witnessing, uh, experiencing, just as you do again this evening, um, their story called Traces. This is some of the thoughts that they've shared about this evening. We are artists who live and work in Sault Ste. Marie. We have our respective art practices, but because of the many points where our visions intersect, we often work together as a collaborative team. Annie was born and raised in Algoma, and Michael has lived here for four decades. Both of them are full-time practicing multimedia artists who work in sculpture, painting, video, sound art, and performance art. The physicality of their respective practices provides the opportunity to create an immediacy in our performances and installations. Their goal is to provide an immersive experience that highlights their respective aesthetic. The traces that we leave, and I find these words so profound. The ashes, our footprints, melted ice and echoes, and stains of our process speak to broader concerns over exi existential threat to the planet, but also to the cathartic power of art. I invite you to join me in welcoming them.
When I was a child, we lived on the shores of Lake George, stacking rocks, digging in the dirt, looking for worms. I'm below the tree where my brother once accidentally shot the songbird hidden by the leaves with his BB gun. He cried big tears. This day was burning day. The grass needed to be rejuvenated with fire. Something my dad did from time to time. The fire moves along the grass in a march. My dad and older brother with shovels and buckets and rakes. I have my rocks. I have my worms. Go play. I play. I was wearing a new windbreaker. Top look for the time. I play on my haunches, examining the rocks, bugs, worms. They keep my attention. Intense focus. I'm in my world. I'm ripped from it. My dad rips my jacket off my back, the one that's the top look for the time. It's on fire. He stomps on it, putting it out. I was so enthralled with what I was doing. I didn't realize I was on fire. This was not the only time the land had engulfed me, brought me to a quiet place. What possesses anyone to bore through three feet of ice to catch the elusive lake trout? In Atrican, on a lake named Bass, en Francais. The hole freezes as fast as I can clear it. So I just stare through the film of ice as if my gaze will melt it. My footprints around the hole have been turned to slush by the welcome appearance of the early spring sun, making me think of the warmth of summertime on the lake yet to come. A footprints on the beach around the fire pit and a fireflies flickering at night on shore as the arm of the Milky Way traces across the night sky. Of the lonely sound of the train whistle as it winds through the hills and along the shoreline. The backyard of that home, the yard away from the shoreline, 
Dad dumped a truck full of sand. He seeded it for grass. Hours setting up forts, tunnels, and roadways for our toy cars thwarted all his efforts, over and over again. The yard never had grass, but it held our attention for hours on end. This particular day, I spent hours, or what seemed, engrossed in creating bases, setting up buckets full of plastic army men. BB gun target practice would happen later. Mum and Dad are keeping an eye on me through the living room window. I make a small rock barrier over here. These sticks pressed into the earth on their end will work well. The sun warms the surface of the sand. Just under is cool to the touch. The sand runs through my fingers. The trees are still today. I am quiet. Hey! Dad bursts out the back door. He has something in his hand. An axe or a rifle? Hey! I look to where my dad's gaze is fixed. A black bear startles. Time feels slow. It has eyes like my dog. We hadn't noticed each other, each interacting with the land in silence, but now lock eyes for a millisecond. She torques back into the woods. Dad picks me up and inspects me for damage. I'm fine, and it was magic. But for now, here I sit, fishing, immobile, watchful, in the shadow of Moby Dick, equally immobile, undisturbed, as he towers above the shoreline. He's been here for eons, rising majestically, evidence of millions of years of violent, primordial volcanic eruptions from deep within the core of our planet, of titanic upheavals that mold and fold the Earth's shallow crust, which are then carved and shaped by the terrifying weight and almost imperceptive caressing of glacial ice. Atchikan, the Batuana Bowl, the Gouli, Chippewa, Montreal and Agawa River Valleys, the black fingers of basalt, sliding into the cold waters of Superior. Mighty fault lines, jagged tentacles of the submerged Lake Superior Rift Valley, tearing through the lake bed and the enveloping rugged highlands which fill with cascading rapids and falls. Monumental records written in stone of the cycles of ice and melt waters, grinding and flooding and forming. Lake Agassiz, Lake Ojibwe, the Terrell Sea, forerunners of Superior, of James Bay, of Hudson Bay. Another thought intrudes. James and Hudson Bay, Algoma, the Algoma Central and Hudson Bay Railway, the ACHBR, affectionately known as the All Curves and Hard Bumps Railway. A modern dream or folly to link Sault Ste. Marie to the ice-filled Northern Ocean, home to the Orca, Beluga, and Minke.
I get caught in the magic of this land. I have roamed as a child and into adulthood. I return to the silence. Lakes like oceans, creeks to wade through, wetlands to watch the birds perform. And now I have a pack of my own, three daughters that share my skill at getting lost in time on the land, my wild ones. Barefoot on paths of fragrant moss, collecting treasured stones from the superior shore. Or when the snow flies, breaking icicles off ice caves and wielding them like magic wands. I marvel at them, maneuvering on balanced beams of washed up trees, as skies from the north are tinted pink. A fog? No, a haze, a summer of distant forest fires. I feel unbalanced, crushing waves of eco-anxiety. The jack pine can only do so much. As Moby Dick slumbers silently in a solemn landscape, my mind wanders and wonders, thinking of those other magnificent whales, the fleshy ones, primeval, sapient beings drawn to the increasingly warmer waters of the big Arctic bays and eventually washing up on the stony surfaces to offer up their bones to watchful carvers, thinking of the polar glaciers that are rapidly thawing breaking off and plunging into the sea, thinking of the permafrost melting menacingly beneath the once frozen earth, thinking of how our insignificant individual footprints can collectively destroy a planet, thinking of my mortality when my energy field is totally consumed, does my consciousness collapse like a dying star to a singularity trapping light, time, and memory. Thinking of how water constitutes our bodies, can I freeze into an icy stalagmite? Thinking of, my thoughts are broken by the deep sonorous sound of ice fracturing across the lake. Maybe Moby Dick isn't slumbering after all.
bravo, my two friends, for sure. Uh, so amazing, right? Absolutely amazing. Let's give them another. Thank you. Yeah. So I know for me, and certainly I invite all of you to uh, share, think, and if you have a question, get it ready. Uh, but I know for me, one of the things I wanted to know as I witnessed this last evening, and again watched it this evening, one of the things that I know I'm interested in, in understanding a little bit more as the storytellers through this art is how has the, how has the interpretation of what you've done changed? Because I know you've done this on more than one occasion. <laughs> well, we, we came together um, both with our individual practices and... Um, can everyone hear? Can, yeah, okay. We came together with our individual practices and when the call came out for Story Stupid and Stone, we, we came together to, to make something deliberate for, for that set of programming. Mm -hmm. um, it's definitely evolved over time. Um, do you wanna speak to that a bit? Yeah, um, thank you. <laughs> the, the um, we, we tried to get a, as often as we could into um, obviously the north mm -hmm. and, and um, shoot the film in the different seasons except winter. <laughs> but yeah, the, the, um, the sculpture and the painting again reflect our practices over, over the years. We, as you said, we discovered that we had a lot in common and we um, um, decided to, to take bring the two practices together and um, start, we, we started thinking about this um, when, when the call came out and uh, yeah, it's, it's evolved considerably. Mm -hmm. The story, the, the storyline especially. Yes, and you talk about those uh, four seasons. So of course all of us who might be from this region, living in this area, love the land, love the lay of the land, we're connected to the land. And clearly, both of you are, in terms of understanding what you're telling us here. I love that you uh, talk about the four seasons. And uh, I know, uh, Annie, you talk about your children. So the next generation, you talk about your, you know, what you remember with your own family, but now you've got your next generation. And how does that impact what, you, what we see here? Absolutely. It's, it's such an honor to be able to look at the landscape that I grew up on through their eyes. And um, they don't need any introduction to it. They're, they are our wild ones for sure. They're going out there, they're getting dirty, they're playing, they're instantly rolling in the dirt and having a good time. And um, it's an instant connection. And it's so nice, it's so wonderful to watch in them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you're a grandpa, right? I am. I'm a new grandma. And I know for me, one of the things that I'm thinking about, not only with my own children, as I watch them do what they did when they were growing up, I now think about my grandchild, and I think about the footsteps that I'm leaving, that this current generation is leaving, and what's going to be there for my granddaughter, what's going to be there for your grandchildren, what's going to be there for all of our uh, future generations. You know, for me, I think about what we call seven generational thinking. How does that come to life here? Uh, it's quite impactful. Um, again, um, I wonder what we're leaving the next generations. Um, I mean, our, our footsteps, as we said in the, the, the narrative, can be uh, traces of our, 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 of our past. You know, I think of... of the recent discoveries of footsteps in the desert going back thousands and thousands of years, tracing, again, our, our humankind's mm -hmm. evolution. And yet, you know, I, I also think of our footprints and the footprints that we've had, for example, in the Arctic. And um, I've spent uh, time in, in uh, the Northwest Territories. And uh, one of those profound experiences, which influenced uh, a lot of like the performance with burying this, the ice back into the sand, was seeing ice protruding out of the banks of the, the, the sandbanks along the Yellowknife River. And thinking at first, wow, that's neat, and then finding out that, no, that's the permafrost 
and it's thawing and it's it's erupting through the land and and you know that that's terrifying mm -hmm. absolutely and i know uh, yesterday when we were visiting one of the things that uh, you were going to think about for today is any messages really and truly that you wish for us to hear vocally um, in terms of final thoughts well um one of the things that I'd like to highlight is the sort of the joy in the experience and the room that there is for simultaneous grief. Um, that those go hand in hand as part of our human experience. And that, that sort of nuance, which is hard to capture, I hope we um, elicit it in our work here today. Yeah, and I hope the traces that we leave are good traces, not uh, not destroying the land. Mm -hmm. but, um, uh, I echo what, what uh, Annie said. Uh, I mean, to me, art, or to both of us, art is a catharsis, and and you know, it, it's it's the way for us to a tell our stories and 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 b um, really work through some of the issues that keep us awake at night. Absolutely, for sure. Be watch for that. I would really love to hear from our audience that's here in our uh, same space. Does anybody have any questions, anything thought-provoking that, as you witnessed, you'd like to mention? Yes. I'd just like to ask, Annie, what does fire mean to you? When you say it's such a, such a creative way. <laughs> okay, and I'm just going to repeat that so our audience that's listening on the web can hear us. Annie, what does fire mean to you? Well, I've been working with fire for some time now. I started while I was in graduate school. And I, I use it for a multitude of reasons. One being the, the, the tactile quality that you can get from burning something. So like the actual, the, the richness of the black that you can get from um, charred wood. So um, visibly, like visually, I find that really um, scrumptious. <laughs> And then um, also the, the significance that fire has for me in terms of memory in particular. Um, growing up, having bonfires, like all of my family memories are all associated with the scent of fire. I've learned in interactions with other people the different um, ways that fire, the scent of fire has affected other people, some negative, some positive. And I find that really interesting, the, the, that scent holds so much and, and connects so much to our memories. Um, also, the, I mean, I can write an essay about this, but um, <laughs> the, the sort of symbolic nature of fire being both destructive, but also is used to rejuvenate. Um, and charcoal, for instance, being able to be used as a purifier. So within that destruction, there is some good. So there's lots that I kind of keep drawing from, and I've been drawing from that for over a decade now. So Awesome, beautiful. Anybody else? Yes. Uh, Michael, what was in the bottle, the little bottle at the end? Uh, oxides and, and charcoal. Um, well, the charcoal um, relates to to what Annie is doing, and, and also, um, again, it's 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 a trace, you know, a, an index of something that's happened, and um, putting it in the, I kind of wrestled with what what to drop in the the uh, <laughs> recesses that I. I uh, and carving, <laughs> and uh, it, it just seemed fitting that, uh, you know, with, um, add to what Annie said, the uh, charcoal, um, uh, she made reference to the forest fires and, and the, both the rejuvenating quality of it and the destructive quality of it. So for me too, it's, it, it's the same. And, and charcoal, interestingly enough, I'll, mostly I use ice, um, but charcoal, is, is again a bit of a catharsis for me, as, as is fire. I mean, I've, I'm frankly, as growing up, I was just, um, lost friends in, in house fires, and I'm terrified of fire. 
And I've had to work through that all my life. Awesome, great question. Thank you much for uh, sharing. And uh, what I would love to do is when we turn the lights, the house lights back on, uh, invite you to come and see uh, what is up here because it is might be a little challenging for our back audience to see uh, the beauty of this story up close. So I invite you to come. I do thank you for your participation. And for those of you that have joined us uh, through the beauty of internet, I thank you. We also need to acknowledge our uh, sponsors. Stories Steeped in Stone is brought to you by the partnership of Friends of Ermatinger Clerk National Historic Site and Theatre in Motion. We are grateful for the funding from Canadian Heritage, which has allowed this series to come to life. The next Stories Steeped in Stone episode will be happening same time, same place, and will feature the premiere of Wasn't It Grand, a theatrical ret retro perspective of Sault Ste. Marie's original opera house written and performed by the one and only Tim Murphy. Show date is on August 18th. And in the audience tonight, we have Rusty McCarthy and Maya Bannerman, who will be performing a St. Mary's River Fantasy in September, and Mark Dunn debuting his song cycle, Rootless, in October. I wish to uh, say thank you, and in my language, Chimi Gwetch, from my heart to yours, uh, for joining us this evening in this beautiful storytelling. Miigwech to our artists. Miigwech for letting me stand with you up here. It is an honor for sure. And we thank all of you watching um, for allowing us this celebratory evening in July. Amazing to me, it's July. <laughs> Miigwech, let's give everybody a hand, everybody. Thank you, Liz. Yeah. Miigwech, miigwech, yes. Nice to meet you and watch you in action. Yeah. I've never